From the Library of Maria Menounos, this is Book Circle Online, featuring in-depth discussion, insight, news, and commentary on all the world's leading book titles and their authors. And now, Book Circle Online. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Book Circle Online. I'm your host, Jeffrey Masters, and I'm here today with Joshua Moore. He's just released his fifth book called All This Life, and today we're going to talk about it. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. I really enjoyed the book. Oh, right on. Yeah. I dug it. Yeah, it was a pretty uh, bold like opening scene with On the Bridge. Did you ever read Colin McCann's great novel, Let the Great World Spin? I did not. It's set in 1970s Manhattan, and then it opens with the high wire walker between the two twin towers. Okay. And it's such a spellbinding, mesmerizing image that I kind of thought to myself, I want to find a way to do that for San Francisco. Yeah. So then came up with this kind of fictional, fictitious, I believe is how you would actually say that word. Uh, this fictitious <laughs> brass band, you know, who marches off from the San Francisco side to the middle of the Golden Gate Bridge and slowly one by one, they, they all commit suicide. Yeah. It, and so that was kind of like the impetus for a lot of the story in the book. Was that the impetus for the story for you writing it as well? Like that image? It's funny because, you know, you ask 50 different authors, you'll get 50 different uh, responses in terms of how they work with process. Of course. But in my world, I only want to know how a book is going to start. So okay. I know when I start a novel, I know the first image. And then I have no idea what the hell is going to happen after that. Really? I, I love that reckless process of discovery. I think that's that's really what fires me up as an artist. So it means I'm going to take 59 million wrong turns along the way like until I actually sure. get it right. Uh, but I dig that, that wanton um, kind of like meandering in the dark. I think that yeah. stuff's really fun. I guess I'm curious then like how you crafted like the bridge scene, like how much changed, like was it always a band? Because like done wrong, people I think would have like stopped reading it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I totally hear that. Um, actually, I wrote that scene pretty much in one shot. Really? Like I, I kicked it around for a few months and then kind of like blocked it out in my head so yeah. by the time i was putting it on paper i knew the choreography i knew how it was supposed to look um it had been kind of mentally storyboarded so then i could just sit down and clack it out gotcha i mean talking about these like mental images too i i don't know that you could have like told that part of the story in like any other form just because like i always think i always used to think that like I was reading books and visualizing everything as it happens, but for this, I wasn't. Hmm. And um, I don't know that it were like a movie you could have gotten away with showing like 12 people jumping. Right. Um, which surprised me because like I, it was, I didn't need to see it, but I still got it. And I mean, it was like mesmerizing. It was horrific and public, but like beautiful. Yeah. Well, I think that if I've done my job right in this book, there I've left some space for the reader to occupy and that she gets to imagine in her mind's eye how these things are supposed to look. So I'm not yeah. necessarily, I mean, I'm giving you enough detail to like concretely hold your hand, of course. but I'm, I'm giving you enough space so like Jeff's imagination can see one thing and somebody else's imagination can kind of tweak it over here. Yeah. So the reader then becomes this active participant in the story moving forward. Yeah. And like, I guess like as the reader for me, like it all hinged on their like, lack of like emotion in doing it just like being at peace like that's what like drew me in i was like wow they're not and they'd gotten over like the emotional part of it almost yeah well we live in such a memoir centric society right now we're always craving or slaking the why you know why did this happen why did this happen why does it tell me more so there are a few mysteries in this book like you never necessarily find out concretely why they jumped right it's just that's what they did, and the story sort of moves on from there. Yeah, I mean, uh, I I didn't feel the need to know. Also, okay. I mean, also though, like I um, I don't know. I think that suicide is such a complex thing that like you never can know. Right. So, like I was like okay, not knowing. Well, and that's the thing is that you don't want to reduce anybody to this like bullshit lifetime channel like easy answer yeah like this is so pat this is so reductionist and what we're talking about is this you know elaborate and you know complicated um tine of the human animal so you want to allow it to 
be as complex as it as it needs to be. Yeah. Is that why you decided to have one of the people survive? To like add that complexity? I needed that I needed one survivor from the jump so a different survivor in the story could forge some sort of connection with her. So oh. she could Sarah, one of the the, the, the novel follows seven main characters. Yeah. Uh, and one of them is a survivor in her own right, and she needed to have that mirror in order to kind of find some kindness, or, you know, or find some grace to keep moving forward, even though her life is not sort of bueno right now. Oh. <laughs> is that a good way to say no, that? No, totally. It's like uh, it's like how like ninety percent of uh, people who try to kill themselves and are not successful. Right. And not that's a good phrasing of it, but don't complete it. Yeah. They all are like, no, I'm happy that I'm still here. Sure. So like that was her way of being yeah. like, oh, there's a, a open window. A and that's hope. an interesting thing about the Golden Gate Bridge too is it's this suicide celebrity that like you know people make pilgrimages to kill themselves yeah. off of the Golden Gate Bridge. And there was a great documentary film about the bridge a few years ago. Um, and the couple of people who had survived it, you know, both very earnestly said, you know, as soon as their feet left the bridge, they're like, oops. Really? Yeeks. And I think that's that part is really interesting to me. They're like, you think that you're leaving this place and ending up someplace else, and then you come to you know, locked in the same consciousness. Wow. But even your circumstances are going to be even more complicated, you know, from a post-suicide perspective. Um, and why are, don't they, like, raise the rails? There's been all sorts of plans. Like, there's now, is a net, but now, I mean, people, people, if people want to kill themselves, that they're always going to find they're a gonna way. They're going to find a way, yeah. You know, um, I think, you know, there's that, there's that history, and there's some romance to it. I mean, there is a sort of, sex appeal to suicide from a certain vantage point and they want to fetishize it as much as they can like yeah this is the spot historically there's been over 1500 documented suicides and there's been many many more who have washed out to see that people don't know about it and this they want to participate and it's crazy but that's i think what's what's happening yeah i mean that's why i'm like it scares me when like things like this this was fiction but like um in real life when it's publicized on the news because then like it gives people ideas right like you said like it fetishizes it like this is an option yeah it's scary and it becomes this kind of self um perpetuating mythology too that it, yeah. it, it reinvents itself in 1970 and 81 and 89 and 2015 yeah and I thought like it was interesting, like the question of like the ethics of posting the video. There was a video in the book of like all twelve jumpers. Um, that's like never been an issue in the past. It's, we've never had that capability. And now, like, what do you do with that video? One of the the, the person who posts the video is a fifteen year old boy. So he sort of <clears throat> boy he straddles that line, you know, where he's yeah. he's mutating into a man but he's certainly not there yet you know and i think what's what's interesting about about his vantage point too is he very um sincerely believes that it's his entire generation's calling to upload everything that they possibly can about this you know great ecosystem that that we call earth and you know his parents or some older generations are saying like well, why are you doing that? Yeah. It doesn't make any sense to me. Why, what was the urge to make you want to publicize this horrific event? Like, what was in it for you? And, you know, the boy would then say, like, it's not about what's in it. The Internet is this grand information exchange. And what we have to do, it's my duty to post content, to post content, to post content. And if everybody does it, we'll be smarter for it whether yeah. he's right or wrong is up for the reader to determine but that's his yeah psyche. i mean it reminded me of when like the two journalists were beheaded in the middle east yeah, and the video sure. was playing um i didn't watch the video i don't i like didn't feel the need to see it like i wasn't ignoring it like i read about it and made sure like i knew this happened but like i didn't need to see something like that right and yet it was like replayed and it must everywhere. have had you know millions and millions of hits you know i think there's that there's that lurid curiosity that we want to pretend that we're not infected with. Yeah. But we all are to a certain extent. I mean, there's a pornography to it that we can't 
ignore. I mean, just the other day, somebody sent me a clip of this Thai guy, sorry for rhyming, um, putting fire ants on his penis. And I was like, I, I was like, am I going to, am I complicit in this? Like, am I actually going to watch this? And of course I did. I mean, I hated myself, but I, I absolutely just devoured it. It was hilarious. Then did he do it just for the sake of the video? Absolutely. Really? Yeah, it was him and like two of his buddies standing here, um, opens his underwear to fire ants, and obviously it does not go well. Oh, really? Okay. Spoiler Spoilers. alert. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> God. The, um, and I want to like re-clarify when I said like it was, there was a beauty to their suicide. I didn't mean that was beautiful. I just meant like... It reminded me of like the Titanic as mm. the boat's going down and these four musicians are like, let's just keep playing. Right. And they play the soundtrack to their death. Like well, that's what these people were doing. And it's my job as the writer to, you know, construct lovely lines. Like, yeah. I have to, my job is to render whatever it happens to be. If it's over here in like squalor town, USA, or if it's over here in a more graceful moment, like I have to treat these moments as opportunities to write the most beautiful prose that I'm capable of writing. Yeah, totally. I love the line in the motel room about, like, sometimes when you're in a motel room and, like, things, there's no hope, you can, like, have these conversations with yourself. Yeah. I think she was in the bathtub. Right. Well, yeah. I think what's interesting, too, is that one of the, the, the themes that thrums throughout the novel is this idea that we don't get to pick when the good stuff happens. You know what I mean? Like, there can yeah. be, like, for example, we're in Encino, California, and like 10 minutes ago, I was sitting in a Ford Focus, shoveling a tuna sandwich in my mouth. And like on the surface, you're like, that sounds sort of sad. But at the same time, like my agent was reading me this like beautiful review of the book that, that just came in. So yeah. Like, it was a good moment, even though I was like sweating and smelled like mayonnaise. <laughs> you know yeah. what I'm saying? It can, be, it can be both of those things at the same time. And that's what's so cool about being alive. Yeah, I mean, not a lot of, like, every character in the book was going through, like, some very hard things. For sure. Which is, like, what makes it interesting. I love, you know? I love I'm, I'm drawn to ensemble storytelling. I'm a huge fan of those old Robert Altman flicks from the 60s and 70s, or, you know, Nashville, The Player, MASH. I think all those things are really um, meaningful to me. So I wanted to set out, I always have a frame of reference for a novel that isn't another book that I try, I'm, I'm trying to emulate. It's like a, one of my past novels, Turn My Parade, I was trying to see if I can capture on the page as much chaos this, that Sam Shepard does on the stage. Yeah. Like, that was like a big challenge. And this one was the same thing. Like, can I, can I write down an Altman film? You know, because when you're juggling seven different characters, there are so many things that can go wrong. You know, especially if, like, a, if a reader starts to really identify with one of them, then every time you switch characters, they're like, no, take me back here. I want to be back here. Yeah. Um, so I have to make sure that I'm um, giving everybody these nuanced, you know, idiosyncrasies. There's always momentum. So even if you're not with your favorite character, it's just as interesting as when you're riding shotgun with that person. Yeah, totally. With all the different characters, too, um, because, like, the suicide was such a major part of the story and then one survived, I kept wondering, like, are we going to meet her? Like, is she going to pop up? Was that, like, an intentional? <laughs> there, were two, there were two decisions about the band that I made later in the drafting process. So I'm a huge yeah. believer that in order for an author to do her job right, that we are writing, like this crazy extendo book that's going to be like a thousand fifteen hundred pages and okay. that's for that's us filling up our reservoir of information learning everything about the world and the characters that we possibly can and then you you're gonna then manicure it down whittle it to this you know 300 pages 400 page thing that is just the details that you've cherry picked for the reader. But Wait, I'm sorry. Are you saying that you've written a thousand words and are cutting it down or throughout the process you will have written a thousand words? I'm saying that there were, there were drafts of this that were about a thousand pages really? long. And that was just including like, you know, everybody's backstory, you know, mythologies, playing wow. some of these things to the end. Um, oh. And just so I, just so I know that stuff. It's almost like, you know, if, if you shoot a feature, right, you have 
more gotcha. and more material, and then a lot of that hits the cutting room floor. We say, well, maybe we don't need this here. We kind of set it over here. We can, we don't want to repeat ourselves. Um, and that's that way, a lot hitting the cutting room floor. It is. It is. It is. But what I was getting at was that the cult, the brass band, like I know the whole story. I know why yeah. it came into being. I know what happened to the survivor. And I may, I may still write about that woman. I'm not totally sure that I'm done with her. Okay. Um, but it didn't make it into this book. Oh, that's interesting. I hope so. That's the idea, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I mean, I've he, I read reviews not about this book, but other books being like, they never told us what happened with blank. And I'm like, yes, that's because it's interesting. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't want a bow tied like, really tight on every right. book. Well, and I, you know, I also think that when you when you enter a book, there's like a subset of questions that will be hopefully answer to one extent or another by the end. But I also like books that there's going to be a new subset of questions introduced at the end. The, the suggestion that life is going on after the end. So we don't have anything that's too easy. You know, we don't have anything that's, you know, pandering to, mm -hmm. to the Hollywood audience. You know, we're, we're used to Hollywood has sort of trained us that like by the final frame, everything's going to be fine. Yeah. And when you write literary books, it's a, you, you have to belie that tradition. You have to make it seem that human life and all its sloppy glory, you know, is going to be going on past page to the end. Yeah. That's hard, like you said. We've been really well trained. Well, it has to, to be, not. you know, it has to be this finite experience and that you're offering some element of closure so it's satisfying to an audience yeah, yeah. but it can't be you know you don't want to like the credits to roll and they're like but but what, what happened to this what happened to that what happened to that then it's not satisfying for them but it is okay for there to be suggestions of things um to come yeah totally um, regarding technology and like social media was a big part of the story. I don't think it was the most optimistic of you concerning that. <laughs> um, was, is that something that like, it was a lot of like in the parent relationship, right. um, like the kid is growing up and he only knows social media and technology. Is it something that concerns you like raising like a child now? It's something I'm aware of. I mean, my daughter's only two years old, so I, yeah. I probably have like at least another six months. <laughs> I can tell she has an iPhone. Sure. Um, but I am very cautious, uh, very interested in the notion between our analog and our digital identities. Yes. And how, I mean, I think if you asked anybody, you know, they would say that they want to use technology to help them live the happiest life that they can do, um, though we probably don't use it that way. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, on one hand, we want to say that, oh, this is just this augmenting force that I'm using to fulfill myself. Yeah. But really what it has amounted to, at least in, in my world, too, is this, this, this dopamine thing, you know, or this phantom limb paradigm where I'm constantly like I'm scratching this I'm scratching this limb that, that's yeah. that's not there and if, if, if my iPhone isn't out it, I, I'm in pain Jeff veritable pain um, and I don't know I mean the book doesn't necessarily answer those questions the book is supposed to start the conversation yeah you know? and then the people who take the time to to read the book they get to have the the kind of those community discussions. Yeah, it's just it's possible nowadays to have a complete life online that's like wholly separate than like your actual life. Um, I mean, when Paul the father questioned like, "Is this the worst thing he's ever put online?" Right. Like, what do I not know? Like, that's a serious and like scary question. Right. That like has to be answered. Well, and the and the, the teenage boy is always calling himself a disaster shepherd. You know, this idea that. He's filmed this disaster because he's filmed it. It's his. The duty. He's in charge of it. Like, yeah. And it's a task that he takes, you know, very seriously. I mean, I'm not a Luddite, you know. I, I'm not saying that, like, technology is bad because there are examples of technology being used in a very positive way in the book. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I wanted to kind of raise both sides of the argument. I mean, San Francisco, I mean, I've lived in San Francisco for 20 years. I came of age in that town. I moved there when I was 17. Um, and now we're watching it basically become 
another iteration of the Wild West. You know, like when when gold was discovered, there was this influx of money and all hell broke loose. And the same thing is happening right now, except right now it is happening in an analog sense. It's also happening in a digital sense because so much of the startup money is right in San Francisco. And I think that part of it is fascinating. This idea that you can have like two wild wests yeah. happening at the same time. And, and like you wrote in the book though, that um, it's like dismantling every bit of strangeness that once right. made San Francisco extraordinary. Like where is that, where are those people going? Well, it's funny because you know? there, when I drive at a, of an office downtown at this uh, artist collective called the Writer's Grotto, uh, and I, I take, the, the route that I take to get there, I can see all the kind of construction cranes hanging and I always imagine those cranes like plucking up an artist and putting down a Twitter employee so like we lose a little bit more of the strangeness and like another tech person yeah. plops down and I think one of San Francisco's chief concerns right now is that if it becomes a city that is only interested in monetizing everything um, it's going to be as homogenous as a suburb yeah. And it was, you know, this was a town that was this place where every oddball, every misfit who was rejected from wherever he or she was rejected yeah. from could come here and we were all accepted. Yeah, from and like the 40s and 50s, like absolutely, way back. Absolutely. And if we if we lose that, I mean, that's really to our peril. I don't know where those people are going, though. Because, I mean, they're, the big cities are too expensive. Right. I don't think they're, like, I can't imagine them living in the suburbs, you know, but I yeah. guess they have to go somewhere. Well, there's been a pretty big artist diaspora in San Francisco to Oakland. Oh. And actually, I know a lot of great artists who have fled San Francisco for Los Angeles, which is very interesting. You wouldn't... You wouldn't think that, yeah. Um, unless they were trying to like transition into TV or films. But now, the property's much cheaper here huh. than it is in SF. Crazy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, even here though, um, I would do some work in Venice Beach, and Google opened up an office there, and someone else did. Um, the YouTube space is there, and like Ren has increased like so much there. Yeah. And Venice is like kind of grimy and like a little strange but it's great and there's not tourists there and right. i love it but like now it's like my friends can't afford it I'm like yeah. no yeah a friend of mine was gonna spend the summer living up in canada and she has a one bedroom studio in the castro district of san francisco um she rented it out for forty five hundred dollars it's a shithole you know and you're just like if people are going to pay it, people are going to pay it. I mean, it's in, it's incredible what's happening right now. That's bizarre. And I know that, like, it's changing what San Francisco used to be, but the other end of it, it could not have happened. Like, this change couldn't have happened, and then it could have ended up like Detroit. You know, like, industry leaves. Well, the, what, uh, the cool thing about the tech um, influx is that it's creating these vibrant online communities that we were just talking about. Yeah. So it isn't necessarily just like, tech people are bad. I mean, that's reductionist and who cares about that? Yeah. Like, we want to say like both sides of it. Like, let me give you an example about about how in my own life, like I've used a, an online community in a way that was like incredibly meaningful. So this winter, New Year's Day, giving my daughter a bottle, six in the morning, having the time of our life, everything's good, right? And then all of a sudden, from my right shoulder to my right foot, I totally lost the feeling in my body. You know, and there's that moment where you say, this isn't good. Right. Um, you know, in the ambulance to the emergency room, and they figured out that I had a stroke. And they're, I'm, I'm only 39, so they're like, well, you probably shouldn't be having strokes. So in the midst of doing their due diligence, they figured out that I have, have this congenital heart defect. And I had to have heart surgery. This is, we'll get to Twitter and eventually. Just give me a second. Okay, like, no, 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 please. This is fascinating. <laughs> so as I was waiting for the surgery, oh, the surgery was, I, I'm missing a wall in the middle of my heart. Like I should, ha everybody has atriums, left, right atrium, right atrium, and I just have one atria. Um, and because without that wall, anytime you have a blood clot, it just goes right up to your brain. What should happen, you, know, you get blood clots sometimes, but it hits that wall and gets filtered through your lungs. That's what's supposed to happen. So when I was preparing for the surgery, um, my family was in the waiting room. I'm sitting on this gurney, but the surgery is about an hour away. And I had my phone with me and tweeted something to the effect of, 
I'm about to have heart surgery. I'm so scared. You know, thoughts, prayers, whatever you believe in, please. And thought like, you know, maybe my mom would like favorite it. You know what I mean? Like I, I didn't, it was more, it was more something I was doing for myself. Sure. And what I got back was incredible. Huh. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of, of people just like, we're here, we're thinking of you, you're going to be fine, you got this. And like, I was weeping before surgery, but not necessarily out of fear, though I was certainly scared, but because I was using technology in a way that was assuaging loneliness, assuaging yeah. sadness or the potential to, you know, die on the operating table. So... It isn't just, I'm not interested in just simply indicting technology. Like, I'm interested in showing both facets, the strengths and the weaknesses, and, and all this life does that. That's, that's fascinating. I'm glad you're okay now. Yeah, yeah, everything's good. <laughs> Surgery's um, successful. Great. Yeah. That's, um, I can't believe that not, you didn't figure that out earlier. Like, like that's, well, that's, 39's pretty late. This is crazy, though. The, the neurologist said that the stroke was like a warning sign. Like my body was saying, like pay attention you need to, to get this fixed because this is going to kill you in a decade. Wow. Like I would have had one of those mammoth strokes and like hopefully you die or you're like crippled drooling on yourself. And right. I'm, I'm not super interested in that. Sure. Wow. I mean, I was going to ask you if... You, like you're on social media. I was gonna ask you like if you would be on it if you weren't there to like build a community, which unfortunately part of is like selling books and like connecting with authors and fans. But I guess the answer would be yes. Well, I, I mean, I'm also a professor, so I'm a huge believer in community. You know, this idea that one of the reasons that I love teaching is it keeps me privy to this conversation, this enthusiastic conversation in which people who love literature are all sitting around a table talking books. I mean, I love sitting here with you talking narrative because, you know, we're a dying breed. You know, <laughs> it doesn't happen that often. And you have to like, when you find other kindred spirits, like it's very important to dote on those relationships. Like I love Project Runway. That's fine. Like we can have those like empty calorie things. Yeah. It's nice to balance it out a little bit with some more, some literary stuff. Yeah. I mean, that's an inspiring story. I, I mean, it's, it's something I think about a lot because Maybe I'm being a cynic, but like I don't know if I wasn't in the like entertainment industry if I wouldn't be on social media. It just um, you have to do it nowadays. <laughs> well, it's non-negotiable. I think you do have to do it. I mean, I think the the best advice that I ever got was always to market your books or your films or whatever it happens to be with the same level of integrity with which you made the art. You know what I mean? So like, yeah. don't we don't want to like become some hack salesman because people can feel that. You know, if it's, if it's just this yeah. narcissistic, self-serving thing, like people, people don't care. Yeah. But if it's coming from the heart, you know, if you're doing it with a level of, of sincerity, I think people can sense that as well. That's fascinating. On your Twitter, I read that you wrote, you've never worked so hard on a piece of art before. Yeah. Um, I, this is your fifth book. I think that people would assume that like by now it should not be easy, but easier, <laughs> you know, definitely easier. Man, <laughs> maybe for some artists that's, that's happening, but it's not happening in my world. And, and it might not be happening um, intentionally. And what I mean by that is I, I want to be the sort of author who is challenging himself on a project by project basis. Yeah. Like building on the things that I've learned in previous novels. So every new book, I'm stringing my artistic high wire a little higher. Okay. Um, so like I would, there's no way I would have been able to write this book first. I'm juggling too many literary balls. Um, not to say that I don't see merit in, in, my, in my first uh, of couple of books. I do, but I always ask myself at the beginning of every project is some sort of call to arms. Are you willing to fail? I think it's important to repeat that. Are you willing to fail? You know, this idea that artists have to risk falling flat on themselves. Falling yeah. flat on their face. Public embarrassment. You know, buku humiliation. Because that's when we do our best work. Like, we have to be outside our comfort zone with the potential to fail. 
because that's when we're going to work the hardest. And we work the hardest is when we do our best stuff. Yeah. It deal as we talked about some like darker themes in the book. Would people who know you be surprised about that? Or they say, yeah, that's, that's Josh. This is the least dark book that I've really? ever written. <laughs> For sure. Well, and I've also, you know, I've been off booze and drugs for six years. So the three books, uh, my first three books, I was, I wrote opiated. Sure. That's a verb. That works. I'm fine with it. Do you ever know that, you know that old, uh, I think it's a German folk story about like the shoemaker, the cobbler who had like so many orders of shoes to fill and he would like fall asleep at his desk and couldn't get them. And like these little fairies came and they finished his shoes. You're saying that the fairies finished your books? That's what pills were like for me. Okay. Like I would be writing and I would black out and then the next morning I would I would have no idea that I had written these pages and I would read them and thank God for uh, editors fairies. And editors. And, yeah, editors <laughs> help too to weed through all of that stuff. Oh, that's fascinating. Well, I mean, and going off of that, the character Kathleen is a recovering alcoholic. Mm -hmm. um, her relationship with Deb was like, just like so lovely and oh, nice and like genuine. And well, you know, I think the people often think that being sober is sort of this binary thing, you know, where you're like, you're you're dirty or clean, and and that's it. But what's what's really hard is staying sober, right? And life is going to give you all sorts of actually really good reasons to relapse. And sometimes it'll give you bad reasons and you'll do it anyways just because you feel like that. Yeah. So, I mean, I was able to use Kathleen um, as a character for me to kind of talk about my own brittle and fragile relationship with staying sober because it's, it's hard. Yeah. I mean, I've read a lot of like stories like that and like addiction memoirs i just finished like lit oh yeah I read lit. um yeah great but and all like the recurring themes are you're not recovered you're recovering yeah. always and that the like your sober uh sponsor is like your god <laughs> that like relationship is always present yeah i mean it's i mean i don't think there's anything as singular as like somebody's sobriety like you'll meet people who will say like oh you know i still smoke pot and that's fine and then somebody else would be like what are you crazy like i, I couldn't do that as soon as i got stoned then i would you know do x or y or z so there's like certainly no one size fits all answer you're just trying to find the version of sobriety that resonates with you and you're hopefully able to keep it going totally when i was mentioning the the um opiate fairies earlier yeah what was fascinating with putting together this book is when i was writing all this life my daughter was just born so like obviously we weren't getting any sleep uh, i was already under contract i knew i was going to be late and i was, was trying to squirrel together a little bit of time to actually finish the book but my apartment is right above a laundromat so i would always volunteer to do the laundry I'd get down there, put the clothes in, and I was dictating huge swaths of material to my iPhone. Really? And it was like I would have never, <coughs> I would have never believed that that's how I would put a narrative together. But it was either I do that or I wouldn't have written the book. I'm sorry, why weren't you like typing at the laundromat? There's no time. You know, it was like. Oh, you're folding and talking. Oh, yeah. And oh, all of wow. this is like. Here are the whites. Here's the darks. Let's go to the dryer over here. Like I was in motion. Um, that's almost that's like genius because it's not getting time <laughs> to think. You're just getting the good stuff out. Yeah, there's no wow. time. There's no time to be self-conscious when you're bleaching sheets. That's Over. like should be on a bumper sticker. So <laughs> in the future, is like the writing process something you talk about with other authors and your students or is that fairly personal no I, I feel like it's a it's a dialogue that we have and it's it's something that is constantly evolving too like you know you hear people talk about oh well i have to be in my favorite chair you know wearing my favorite hat and my favorite cup of tea yeah and people writers can be very particular but in my experience um life is going to challenge that um, life is going to throw slop at you and either you evolve and you continue to produce art or you sit there waiting for the perfect moment with your favorite hat um, that's never going to come. So I feel like 
the the less rigid we can be yes. with like what we have to have. All you really have to have um, is probably your butt in a chair. And right. Even that's debatable. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I've got I've like over time like cut out like a lot of the extracurriculars and made it like less rigid. Like I want a yeah. glass of water and I want to wear my glasses. Sure. And, like that's it. <laughs> well, I think the more minimal you can be in terms of your demands just speaks to the likelihood that you're going to finish the project. Yeah, totally. As we're like ending, going towards the end of the interview, we like to ask about like favorite books, like recent books have changed your life. But as a teacher, you teach creative writing, I assume. Mm -hmm. yeah. What are like books that are like on your syllabus that you like always like recommend or like people like, need to read? I like, there's be some, some of my desert island books. Uh, would be The Book of Daniel by E.L. Doctorow. Good novel from the okay. 70s. Uh, it's worth checking out. Nabokov's Pale Fire. Okay. Another good one. Uh, and then Dennis Johnson's iconic short story collection, Jesus Son, is a book that everybody should read. And it's short, so you could read it in an airplane. Jesus's Son or Jesus Son? G Jesus Son. Interesting. Maybe you could say Jesus is son. I don't know. Did you know that Velvet Underground song, Heroin? Yeah. This from And I Feel Just Like Jesus' Son. Oh, okay. Like that. Oh, fascinating. I hate to ask this since you just finished this massive work, but what is next for you? It's a good question. In terms of novel construction, my imagination is totally bare. This is the first time in my life where I don't know what's next. And I think eventually that will panic. <laughs> yeah. Me, but right now I feel sort of free about that. Okay. Um, from a nonfiction perspective, my next book will be um, a, a memoir on relapse. So we've seen several addiction memoirs, but we haven't seen a memoir just focusing on relapse. Oh, fascinating. Um, and that's what I'm going to put together next. Cool. Don't say it too loud. So I'm going to steal that idea. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> well, thank you. This was a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun, too, Jeff. Thank Thanks. you. Yeah. Where can everybody find you on social media? Um, that's a good question. Joshua underscore more, M-O-H-R. On Twitter. On Twitter. Okay. Um, I'm on Facebook and Instagram. And I also make my email very easy to track down. If any aspiring writers have questions, fling me a note. I'm happy to weigh in. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. My pleasure. Yeah. All right, guys, we will see you next time. Until then, you can find all of our content on iTunes, YouTube, and, of course, bookcircleonline.com. Thanks. From managing editor Jason Squamata, executive producers Maria Menounos, Phil Svitek, and Kevin Undergaro, we would like to thank you for tuning in to Book Circle Online. For more discussion, go to bookcircleonline.com. And if you have comments, questions, or book title suggestions, write us at info at bookcircleonline.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this is Book Circle Online. BCO, join the circle. not sort of bueno right now oh. <laughs> is that a good way to say no that? totally it's like <laughs> uh, it's like how uh, like 90 percent of uh people who try to kill themselves and are not successful right and not that's a good phrasing of it but don't complete it yeah they all are like no i'm happy that i'm still here sure so like that was her way of being yeah. like oh there's a, a open window a and shining that's hope. an interesting thing about the golden gate bridge too is it's this suicide celebrity that like, you know, people make pilgrimages to kill themselves yeah. off of the Golden Gate Bridge. And there was a great documentary film about the bridge a few years ago. Um, and the couple people who had survived it, you know, both very earnestly said, you know, as soon as their feet left the bridge, they're like, ups. Really? Yeeks. And I think that's that part is really interesting to me. They're like, you think that you're leaving this place and ending up someplace else and then you come to you know locked in the same consciousness wow. but even your circumstances are going to be even more complicated you know from a post-suicide perspective um, and why are don't they like raise the rails there's been all sorts of plans like there's now is a net 
but now I mean people there people if people want to kill themselves that they're always going to find they're going to find a way yeah you know um, I think you know there's that there's that history and there's some romance to it I mean there is a sort of sex appeal to suicide from a certain vantage point and they want to fetishize it as much as they can like yeah this is the spot historically there's been over 1500 documented suicides and there's been many many more who have washed out to see that people don't know about it and this they want to participate and it's crazy but that's i think what's what's happening yeah i mean that's why i'm like it scares me when like things like this this was fiction but like um in real life when it's publicized in the news because then like it gives people ideas right like you said like it fetishizes it like this is an option yeah it's scary and it becomes this kind of self um, perpetuating mythology too. That it, yeah. it, it reinvents itself in 1970 and 81 and 89 and 2015. Yeah. And I thought that like, it was interesting, like the question of like the ethics of posting the video. There was a video in the book of like all 12 jumpers. Um, that's like never been an issue in the past. It's, we've never had that capability. And now, like, what do you do with that video? One of the, the, the person who posts the video is a 15 year old boy. So he's sort of, <clears throat> boy, he straddles that line, you know, where he's, yeah. he's mutating into a man, but he's certainly not. From the library of Maria Menunos, this is Book Circle Online, featuring in depth discussion, insight, news, and commentary on all the world's leading book titles and their authors. And now, Book Circle Online. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Book Circle Online. I'm your host, Jeffrey Masters, and I'm here today with Joshua Moore. He's just released his fifth book called All This Life, and today we're going to talk about it. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. I really enjoyed the book. Oh, right on. Yeah. I dug it. Yeah, it was a pretty uh, bold like opening scene with On the Bridge. Did you ever read Colin McCann's great novel, Let the Great World Spin? I did not. It's set in 1970s Manhattan, and then it opens with the high wire walker between the two twin towers. Okay. And it's such a spellbinding, mesmerizing image that I kind of thought to myself, I want to find a way to do that for San Francisco. Yeah. So then came up with this kind of fictional, fictitious, I believe is how you would actually say that word. Uh, this fictitious brass band, you know, who marches off from the San Francisco side to the middle of the Golden Gate Bridge and slowly one by one, they, they all commit suicide. Yeah. It, and so that was kind of like the impetus for a lot of the story in the book. Was that the impetus for the story for you writing it as well? Like that image? It's funny because, you know, you ask 50 different authors, you'll get 50 different uh, responses in terms of how they work with process. Of course. But in my world, I only want to know how a book is going to start. So okay. I know when I start a novel, I know the first image, and then I have no idea what the hell is going to happen after that. Really? I, I love that reckless process of discovery. I think that's that's really what fires me up as an artist. So it means I'm going to take... 59 million wrong turns along the way, like until I actually sure. get it right. Uh, but I dig that, that wanton um, kind of like meandering in the dark. I think that yeah. stuff's really fun. I guess I'm curious then like how you crafted like the bridge scene, like how much changed, like was it always a band? Because like done wrong, people I think would have like stopped reading it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I totally hear that. Um, actually, I wrote that scene pretty much in one shot. Really? Like I, I kicked it around for a few months and then kind of like blocked it out in my head so yeah. by the time i was putting it on paper i knew the choreography i knew how it was supposed to look um it had been kind of mentally storyboarded so then i could just sit down and clack it out gotcha i mean talking about these like mental images too i i don't know that you could have like told the pros that i'm capable of writing yeah totally i love the line in the motel room about like sometimes when you're in a motel room and like things, there's no hope. You can like have these conversations with yourself. Yeah. I think she was in the bathtub. Right. Well, yeah. I think what's interesting too is that one of the, the, the themes that thrums throughout the novel is this idea that we don't get to pick when the good stuff happens. You know what I mean? Like there can yeah. be, like for example, we're in Encino, California and like 10 minutes ago I was sitting in a Ford Focus shoveling a tuna sandwich in my mouth and like on the surface you're like 
that sounds sort of sad. But at the same time, like my agent was reading me this like beautiful review of the book that, that just came in. So yeah. like, it was a good moment, even though I was like sweating and smelled like mayonnaise. <laughs> you know yeah. what I'm saying? It can, be, it can be both of those things at the same time. And that's what's so cool about being alive. Yeah. I mean, not a lot of like every character in the book was going through like some very hard things. For sure. Which is like what makes it interesting. I love, I love I'm I'm drawn to ensemble storytelling. I'm a huge fan of those old Robert Altman flicks from the sixties and seventies or you know, Nashville, the player, MASH. I think all those things are really um, meaningful to me. So I wanted to set out I always have a frame of reference for a novel that isn't another book that I try I'm, I'm trying to emulate. It's like a, one of my past novels, Turn My Parade, I was trying to see if I can capture on the page as much chaos this, that Sam Shepard does on the stage. Yeah. Like, that was like a big challenge. And this one was the same thing. Like, can I, can I write down an Altman film? You know, because when you're juggling seven different characters, there are so many things that can go wrong. You know, especially if, like, if a reader starts to really identify with one of them, then every time you switch characters, they're like, no, take me back here. I want to be back here. Yeah. Uh, so I have to make sure that I'm... Um, giving everybody these nuanced, you know, idiosyncrasies. There's always momentum. So even if you're not with your favorite character, it's just as interesting as when you're riding shotgun with that person. Yeah, totally. With all the different characters, too, um, because, like, the suicide was such a major part of the story and then one survived, I kept wondering, like, are we going to meet her? Like, is she going to pop up? Was that, like, an intentional? <laughs> there were two There were two decisions about the band that I made later in the drafting process. So I'm a yeah. huge believer that in order for an author to do her job right, that we are writing, like, this crazy extendo book that's going to be, like, 1,000, 1,500 pages. And okay. that's for that's... that part of the story in, like, any other form? Just because, like, I always think, I always used to think that, like, I was reading books and visualizing everything as it happens. But for this, I wasn't. Hmm. And um, I don't know that it were like a movie you could have gotten away with showing like 12 people jumping. Right. Um, which surprised me because like I, it was, I didn't need to see it, but I still got it. And I mean, it was like mesmerizing. It was horrific and public, but like beautiful. Yeah. Well, I think that if I've done my job right in this book that I've left some space for the reader to occupy and that she gets to imagine in her mind's eye how these things are supposed to look. So I'm not yeah. necessarily, I mean, I'm giving you enough detail to like concretely hold your hand, of course. but I'm, I'm giving you enough space so like Jeff's imagination can see one thing and somebody else's imagination can kind of tweak it over here. Yeah. So the reader then becomes this active participant in the story moving forward. Yeah. And like, I guess like as the reader for me, like it all hinged on their like, lack of like emotion in doing it just like being at peace like that's what like drew me in i was like wow they're not and they've gotten over like the emotional part of it almost yeah well we live in such a memoir centric society right now we're always craving or slaking the why you know why did this happen why did this happen why does it tell me more so there are a few mysteries in this book like you never necessarily find out concretely why they jumped right it's just that's what they did, and the story sort of moves on from there. Yeah, I mean, uh, I I didn't feel the need to know. Also, okay. I mean, also though, like I, um, I don't know. I think that suicide is such a complex thing that like you never can know. Right. So, like I was like okay, not knowing. Well, and that's the thing is that you don't want to reduce anybody to this like bullshit lifetime channel like easy answer. Yeah. Like this is so pat. This is so reductionist. And what we're talking about is this, you know, elaborate and, you know, complicated um tine of the human animal. So you want to allow it to be as complex as it as it needs to be. Yeah. Is that why you decided to have one of the people survive? To like add that complexity? I needed that I needed one survivor from the jump. So a different survivor in the story could forge some sort of connection with her. So oh. she could, Sarah, one of the, 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 the novel follows seven main characters. Yeah. Uh, and one of them is a survivor in her own right. And she needed to have that mirror in order to kind of find some kindness, or, you know, or find some grace to 
keep moving forward, even though her life is there yet. You know, and I think what's what's interesting about about his vantage point too is he very um, sincerely believes that it's his entire generation's calling to upload everything that they possibly can about this, you know, great ecosystem that that we call Earth. And you know, his parents or some older generations are saying like. Well, why are you doing that? Yeah. Like, it doesn't make any sense to me. Why, what was the urge to make you want to publicize this horrific event? Like, what was in it for you? And, you know, the boy would then say, like, it's not about what's in it. The Internet is this grand information exchange. And what we have to do, it's my duty to post content, to post content, to post content. And if everybody does it, we'll be smarter for it whether yeah. he's right or wrong is up for the reader to determine but that's his yeah psyche. i mean it reminded me of when like the two journalists were beheaded in the middle east yeah, and the video sure. was playing um i didn't watch the video i don't i like didn't feel the need to see it like i wasn't ignoring it like i read about it and made sure like i knew this happened but like i didn't need to see something like that right and yet it was like replayed and it must everywhere. have had you know millions and millions of hits you know i think there's that there's that lurid curiosity that we want to pretend that we're not infected with. Yeah. But we all are to a certain extent. I mean, there's a pornography to it that we can't ignore. I mean, just the other day, somebody sent me a clip of this Thai guy, sorry for rhyming, um, putting fire ants on his penis. And I was like, I, I was like, Am I gonna? Am I complicit in this? Like, am I actually gonna <laughs> watch this? And of course I did. I mean, I hated myself, but I, I absolutely just devoured <laughs> it. It was hilarious. Then did he do it just for the sake of the video? Absolutely. Really? Yeah, it was him and like two of his buddies standing here. Um, opens his underwear to fire ants, and obviously it does not go well. Oh, really? Okay. Spoiler alert! Yeah. Oh man. <laughs> God. The um. And I want to like reclarify when I said like it was there's a beauty to their suicide. I didn't mean that was beautiful. I just meant like it reminded me of like the Titanic as mm -hmm. the boat's going down and these four musicians are like let's just keep playing right. and they play the soundtrack to their death. Like well, that's what these people were doing. And it's my job as the writer to you know construct lovely lines. Like, yeah, I have to. My job is to render whatever it happens to be. If it's over here in like squalor town, USA, or if it's over here in a more graceful moment, like I have to treat these moments as opportunities to write the most beautiful